Welcome everybody to this uh, online uh, London Federation of Housing Co-ops Forum. I'm Mick O'Sullivan, the chair. Uh, Greg, do you want to introduce yourself and go around and just have a brief verbal? Hi, my name's Greg Robbins. I'm the Secretary of London Federation of Housing Co-ops and I'm the Treasurer of Dennis Housing Co-op. Uh, Hilary? Oh, sorry. Um, Hilary Elwood, um, MHA, MHC, whichever it is these days, MHC. And I also do a bit of admin work for the uh, executive of the London Fed. Ron? Um, and I'm Ron Bartholomew, the Chief Executive Officer of Middlesex Housing Co op. How about that? Oh, grand. Um, you see, uh, Niall? Uh, I'm the chair of Longlife Housing Co-op and I'm on the executive of the Fed. Martin? Uh, Martin Dumont, chair of Langston Housing Co-op, CCH board member and a London Fed board member. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go around as I see people in the window now and just mention your name. You can, uh, Kate. Um, I'm uh, Unit 11 chair, current chair. Okay, thank you. Glenn? Glenn? All right. Hello, I'm Glenn yeah. Thomas. I'm a member of the EC of the London Federation of Housing Corps. Stephen? Uh, Steve Lancashire from Balfour Street Housing Corp. Carton? Or Catherine? Yes, uh, I'm Catherine from Vector Housing in Notting Hill Gate, Ludbrook Grove. Yeah. And so I have you... another colleague with me, Alex. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Sadiq? I'm Sadiq Sadiq from Long Life Co-op. I'm a co-op team. Yep. Kate? Hi, I'm from South Bank Housing Co-op. John? Um, can you hear me? I can't, don't, I'm on having technical problems. Oh my goodness. I'm oh, here. Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Good. Unit 11. You may not be able to see me, but um, I'm having technical issues, shall we say. Right. Ta-ra for now. Yeah. Paul Taylor. Hello. <coughs> South Bank Co-op. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Mark Allen. Um, ABC Housing Co-op in Southwark. Yeah. Uh, Alexandros. Hi. Yes, I'm with, uh, together with Catherine from Backdoor House Co-op. Okay. Grove. Richard. Uh, I'm Richard Stubbs, Long Life Housing Cooperative, here mainly because I set up the New York Short Life Housing Co-op in 1972, and I'm interested about that part of the agenda. Um, I'll be joined my, my partner, Ruth Waring, in about 15, 20 minutes. Brand. Uh, Edward. Um, I'm the Secretary of Park Hill Housing Co-op in South London. Theo. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm a member of Park Hill as well, and I'm on the um, MC. Emma Key. Yeah, Hello, um, I'm Emma Keenoy. I'm from Three Boroughs Housing Cooperative in Lewisham, London Borough Lewisham. Alison. Hi everybody, I'm Alison. I'm the Secretary of Pearman Street Housing in Waterloo. Grand. Um, right, that seems to be everybody. I've, I've kept, uh, everybody had a chance to say it with... Uh, much ado. I'll just give a brief uh, introduction uh, of what I've been doing anyway for the last some of it might be relevant. Um, I've been uh, at the moment looking at food co-ops and I think we, we uh, the London Fed will probably publish some stuff on food co-ops on the blog in the next uh, while. It's quite interesting stuff and I think it's a way that where we can uh, it's a quite fit for our organisations and it's a way uh, that we can uh, alleviate food poverty amongst our membership. Mm -hmm. Send out details so people yeah. of the co-ops can set up their own food co-ops and links to get involved in this over the next while. The other uh, thing I've been looking at is uh, energy co-ops, Community Energy London. The Mayor of London has just announced a whole series of grants and I think they want to encourage uh, housing co-ops to come in uh, to apply for these grants as well. Uh, Glenn Thomas attended the meetings, the online meetings as well, 
uh, and Glenn, I'll bring you in after I made a, just briefly, if you want to talk about it, just, uh, briefly about it. There is uh, money available out there for uh, energy co-ops. In an, I'm on a committee in Islington where we've just awarded Waverly the eight load of load of dash to put solar panel batteries on the roofs of their properties. So you just have to go out there and grab this money. Also use it, you can use it to alleviate uh, fuel poverty amongst our membership. Uh, Glenn, do you want to come in briefly? Yes. I felt for some time that we, we uh, on the housing co-op side, we should be talking to other kinds of co-ops, the energy co-ops spring to mind. Now, Mick quite rightly said about the London Community Energy Fund number four, which the, the mayor is, uh, has launched two or three days ago. Now, because it's coming to the end of his term, of course, he's like all councillors do, he spends any spare money for his term runs out, or hopefully he will be re-elected. So it's probably too late for any of our members to apply for the DLCF4 because it's, you have to have it all in, the whole lot in, uh, by January the 11th. There are two um, funds. One is for development, and in other words, preparing a scheme ready for a future grant. The second one is a capital scheme, which is very substantial sums of money in, being made available here. The, the overall scheme is £600,000, I think, to, to be spent before um, the, the mayor's term of office runs out in May, or a good part of it, isn't it entirely? You can still, uh, long, once you've been uh, approved, the money still flows. So I think it's something that could rejuvenate our sector as well, because I, I'm on the, um, the board of Barnester housing solar. It's a council of it's a, a housing and an energy co-op. We have a pa panels on the, uh, the roof of a council estate in Homerton in, in London Borough of Hackney. It's going very well. It's, uh, quite, and we come under the, the general umbrella of repowering London. So there are organisations out there which can, and the, the, the other ones, uh, quite a few others. In South East London, there's uh, um, South East London Cooperative Energy uh, they, they're helping to set up things as well. So there are other, if our, any of our members wanted to go on that path, there are people who could help. And we've been doing it either on schools or council. Plus, I don't know any offhand that do the housing association, but I don't see a reason why they shouldn't do. Okay? Yeah, that's fine. Just to mention that, that as well as the mayor doing this, local authorities have, have tons of money available. I just dispensed over £600,000 worth of grants in the last two years to various organisations. Unfortunately, there wasn't that many co-ops who were interested in, in applying for this. But this is a way of, uh, you know, ensuring that your properties are um, future-proofed. You can also get money from the uh, Renewable Heat Initiative towards uh, insulation and installing ground source heat pumps that will help... Uh, uh, again heat your properties especially street level properties over the winter uh, well worth exploring this i will put a number of initiatives on this there's a tmo in islington that's uh, looking into this uh, basically replacing their uh, communal boiler system communal heating system with a series of ground source heat pumps uh, and it's something i think people should be looking into especially the welfare of their organizations uh, sorry catherine Thank you. May I just say, first of all, I think it's a wonderful idea that all these different co-ops come together. I think it's really good. Um, is there a list or something of the criteria for this capital scheme? You mentioned a few, uh, what we can apply for. Is there something that you can maybe give us later or? Well, yeah. <clears throat> I won't be able to do it during the meeting, but I will. No, uh, no, no, but later I can ask yeah. you, or we can ask you, you yeah. know. Yeah. Glenn, can you yeah. circulate the, actual deta the details of the scheme? Well, when we had our meeting a couple of days ago, hmm? it wasn't finalized, but they will be finalized and published on Monday. Okay. At, yeah. At, at, okay. at City Hall. So the other thing I did mention, and Mick uh, touched up on it as well, is the, the Green Homes Grants. This is a, a government scheme, not only for, for tenants, but owner occupiers and landlords as well. And the problem with that has been that it was supposed to run out um, sort of in the spring. 
But Boris, as Boris Johnson, our so-called prime minister, made an announcement that it would now be extended into 2022. What he didn't say, and what our, our, our speaker from the GLA told us, is that he hasn't made any money available after the first part of it yet. So really, we need to get to our Labour and other people, Conservative preferably, because they have, have his year, which we don't, to, to make sure the money is available. So that if people want to apply later in the summer, because it takes the time to get these things off the ground, that they'll be able to get the money. Uh, right. Uh, in that case, I'll move on to uh, Niall. Do you want to introduce the first item? Yeah, okay, Mick, yeah. Yeah. Um, it'll just be about 10 minutes, hopefully, no more. Yeah. Uh, just bullet points, really. And this is on the issue of co-ops and housing associations. Um, I mean, I'm not the most expert in this because that, that my co-op's not affected by this, but I think there are people here from co-ops who are. And I was contacted a few uh, weeks ago from people from Octavo Housing Association, uh, which brought it to light to me how bad a problem this is, where they said that... Uh, the Optivo senior management were basically trying to impose a new management agreement on them, which I just think is uh, undermines really the essence of a, of a cooperative if that agreement goes into uh, is, is carried out. But I know other co ops have had same, similar problems, like St. Mark's Co op in West London and Unit 11, I think, have had similar problems. Um, and I think it's linked to the fact that housing associations have really moved away from their original mission and have become much more like big business enterprises, particularly the big ones. And we've seen all the big mergers of co of uh, housing associations, which have also not been good in many cases for the co-ops involved uh, there uh, either. And we've seen a hike in service charges and other things being impo imposed, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think just on the uh, some of the issues that come up that are brought to my attention, I mean, this is just some of the issues that uh, Optivo have tried to uh, change in the management agreement. I'll just list, list through some of the key ones, I think, which give people an idea of the type of pressures co-ops are under in Optivo and other places. So, for example, uh, the, the people who spoke to me said basically that the new management agreement would uh, see assured tenancies being ended and um, it would be licenses for uh, the co-ops in the future. Um, particularly those which are shared property co-ops, they would just be only given the option of, of, of having licences. The Housing Association has also made it clear that it would no longer be social rents, as we understand it, but be, in inverted commas, affordable rents, which I think no, most of us know what that means. It means a big hike. Um, they got the impression that the management agreement, the proposed management agreement, is, is written for the managing agents, not for the general needs of the Housing Association, including the co-ops. Uh, they said there's no real attempt to cater for co-ops anymore. Uh, it mentions support of housing, but there's no sense of the general needs of a co-op or understanding of it. Uh, nominations would no longer be or mainly be with the co-ops. That would be done, if you like, over their heads by the Housing Association. And um, any rights that the co-op has at the pr present time, for example, on things like transfers, lodging, subletting, that would all be removed. Again, that would just be the decisions by the Housing Association. There's also been an attempt in this agreement, and this has probably come up in other places, to offload uh, issues like fire and building safety onto the housing co-ops so that the housing co-ops are asked to uh, produce a responsible person, in inverted commas, uh, and in, in a sense, it's the managing agents opting out of the role that they should be playing or have played in the past. Uh, termination. Uh, they give all the indications, there'd be no real arbitration or appeal, just a unilateral term and termination on basically any grounds or very, very scant grounds. Maintenance, uh, the co-op that spoke to me, that's in Optivo, uh, they said that they're currently responsible for spec specified minor works, but under the new agreement, they would be handed a whole list of additional tasks uh, and there'd be more responsibility in, on them without recognising, they felt, and without recognition from the Housing Association of the costs involved in carrying this out. And they're, they're small, there's a small cope that's speaking to me and their ability to do it. 
There would also be extra monitoring and inspection by the Housing Association. Um, and I think, you know, if you just just take those bullet bullet points on their own, I think it all it does all amount to significant and serious undermining of the co-op. Maybe not legally, it's not ending the co-op, but in effect, it's taken away a lot of what we understand as a co-op and how a co-op uh, should run. And I, I think this is linked into the long-term relationships between housing associations and co-ops uh, that have developed. As we know that historically, a number of co-ops established as managing cooperatives of local authority properties. And then those local authority properties over time became the properties of uh, housing associations with stock transfers. Uh, and then of course, since 1994, we've had the tenant, tenant management organizations able to also take over management of local authority properties. And I think the process has been complicated by the mergers that have taken place in recent years, where unfortunately there's been a trend for housing associations to become much bigger. And I would say a much more aggressive type of management that is more interested in um, you know, commercialization and financialization of assets and properties rather than the original mission, which was providing um, homes for, for people, for working people. Uh, in, in particularly in uh, city areas. Um, so it, there, there, there is a, a problem, I, my, you know, the co-op that I spoke to, I mean, they were looking into this, they were going into a process of consultation, so-called, <laughs> with their uh, housing association, and they felt they were getting nowhere, that their, their issues were just falling on stony ground. The housing association said to them that they were they had to make these changes. They said they were manacled by government policy without specifying what that policy was. Um, and I think they also pleaded poverty in some cases. I mean, I think that's a complete red herring. If, you, if anybody looks at the details, housing associations, the big ones anyway, are very wealthy. They're sitting in an enormous amount of assets and money. And that has been the case for uh, quite, quite a few years. And really, you know, it is outrageous in a sense because these co-ops, of course, have been managing these properties and looking after them and repairing them for decades, keeping them in, in, in a good state. And, uh, you know, this co-op that I was talking to, they were going to get legal consultation to see if in any way their housing association was transgressing its original agreement, uh, you know, the original agreements that, they, that were made with the local authority. Uh, and uh, whether the you know transfers the stock transfer process, uh, you know, if anyways that that's been transgressed as well. I'm not too sure how far they're getting that, to be honest, you know. And I haven't had a feedback on them specifically on that issue, but they were looking for looking for independent legal advice. I give them a few pointers before they went back into talks uh, with uh, Optivo. So that that's where things stand at the moment. I'm waiting for an update from uh, the that this co-op. And perhaps other people here who have in, in a similar situation might have more up to date uh, information. But overall, I mean, I think it's an un, it's an unwelcome development. It's not a good trend. It puts a lot of pressure on particularly small co-ops, and uh, it does undermine them seriously. And I think they should obviously try and negotiate to maintain as much independence as they can as co-ops and uh, control over their own affairs and see off the worst of these management agreements. But I think they also have to maybe look broader. If they can't get anywhere through talks, through negotiations, and there's not much they can do legally with legal advice, I think then they have to look up stepping things up a bit, in my opinion, and lobbying and going public in some of this. I mean, one thing we do know is that housing associations don't like bad publicity, and it doesn't look good that they're putting the screw on small co-ops at the present time when we've got a housing crisis. And if we've had COVID and lockdown and the potential of a mass number of people losing their homes or being evicted, not able to pay the rent. We know there's a lot of problems out there at the moment, and I don't think it's going to look very good for big housing associations to be seen to be treating co-ops in a cavalier manner. So that, that's it, Mick. That's, that's the main points, that, as I understand at the present time. Thanks for that, Niall. Mark, you had your hand up. If you unmute. Yes, um, so uh, the co-op, uh, my co-op ABC, are uh, one of those Optivo co-ops, um, and uh, I've been involved in all of the discussions here. Um, I, I just, I, I've kind of got some general points, but also I just wanted to respond immediately to some of what Niall has said there, because um, I think that there's some, 
some of it isn't quite as clear as it should be. Um, so um, the, the first thing that happened before they issued this um, new management agreement, which is a much shorter one. So the, the management agreements that uh, exist are from the late 90s um, and uh, it's the standard modular housing association and managing agent agreement. It's about 100 pages normally. Um, it's, it's very complicated. Um, and they, they, about five years ago, they were wanting to replace it completely and they produced a real hodgepodge of a document. So they actually, what they did was they produced some variations to it. So the bits that needed, in their view, needed to be changed. And we had quite a negotiation about that. And now they've presented a new one completely, which is only about 30 pages. Um, so it's a lot clearer, um, but uh, they, they produced a new tenure policy a couple of years ago, which meant, uh, which said that um, co-op properties were in the, their category of special. And that meant that rather than um, permanent properties being um, uh, uh, being on assured tenancies, they'd be on assured short hold. So this is self-contained permanent properties on assured short hold. No justification for that at all. So that got the co-ops together to say what's going on here. And also that shared properties rather than being on assured or even assured short holds would be on licenses. And those uh, that is what uh, Optivo do directly. You know, they, they have directly managed um, shared properties and they do them on licenses. So in that case, they're saying it's got to be what we do in our general properties. But, uh, but for the uh, permanent properties, it was uh, self-contained. It was saying, actually, no, this is special. They have moved on that. And there's a, a paper going to their board, which would return uh, the self-contained properties to assured even ones that are managed by managing agents. So I think we've made some progress on that. Um, the social rents replaced by affordable. It's not saying they're going to do that, but there's a provision in the management agreement um, to allow them to do that. Um, they're not doing that at the moment. Uh, the nominations, um, this is a really tricky one because there's, there's an argument about whether nominations uh, agreements should be uh, what was agreed at the time uh, of the development, which is the co-op's point of view, that it should be the not should be the nominations agreement that we're party to, which was say one from the '90s. Those have moved on uh, since then. Uh, what, what I think one of the co-ops or the co-op that's been in touch with Nile um, manages quite a lot of shared properties, and it's in the borough of Lewisham. And Lewisham have no way of making choice-based lettings to a shared property. There's no mechanism for that. So. Um, I, th I think that their nominations would remain with the co-op. Um, transfers, yes, they're sticky about transfers. Fire safety responsibilities, they're pointing at the uh, legislation, is it the 2005 order, um, which says that the responsible person has, should be the, the, the body which is in control of the housing. So if co-ops are in control of the housing, then it tends tend to make us the responsible persons, but obviously, that everybody's worried about this now because there are more duties and more responsibilities and more penalties if you don't do it. Um, termination, the existing agreement has complete right for the association to terminate the agreement with no right of appeal, um, except to the board of the association. So they're not proposing to change that. It's no worse than it is. We've been pressing for uh, an arbitration route in case of termination. There is an arbitration in case of dispute. So maybe if termination became a dispute, we'd have to go to arbitration. Um, uh, maintenance, it probably depends a lot on the co-op, uh, what the co-op's doing. It doesn't change the maintenance responsibilities that my co-op has. Um, and yes, there is increased monitoring and inspection uh, of properties and of the groups. Um, it does take away some of the autonomy that some co-ops have enjoyed. Um, and they do tend to point to government policy. Optivo as an organization is very compliance oriented because it was in supervision about 10 years ago. And it's come out of that with a very compliance oriented culture. Um, I think that that's the, that my current comments on the, the specific points there on the, uh, sorry, if that's gone on a little bit long, but I think it's important. I don't think it was quite accurate what, um, what's come through from uh, that co-op to Nile. Uh, one of the key things is why are these properties there? 
And in general, they're there because there were allocations by the housing corporation to uh, for cooperative management. And in some cases, those meant that uh, co-ops became ownership co-ops registered. Um, but in the case of these co-ops, they weren't. And therefore, the ownership is vested in the association. And there's no institutional memory of this inside the association. And the paperwork is really thin on the ground. Um, and even the regulator doesn't seem to have the have it with some well, at least one co-op's done a freedom of information request and it hasn't come up with anything so far but clearly and we've got we've got a statement from a person who worked at the association back then which confirms our view which is that these were allocations made for co-op management so what we want is there to be a preamble or memorandum, memorandum of understanding or something that acknowledges that history, which gives the co-ops standing in terms of these, co uh, these properties. Um, and Optivo is another example of one of these uh, associations that's merged and that does tend to produce a kind of house cleaning. Um, the impression we get is that we're very small as maybe 200 odd properties out of 40,000. So it's really tiny in terms of their whole operation, but it's a compliance risk as they see it. And um, that's what's driving a lot of it. And they have an internal audit of this function, which is uh, due to happen in the next uh, couple of months, I think. That's me finished. Uh, John, John Alger, you wanted to come in on this? Yes. Um, what I would say is network, um, have recently written to us to say that they are reviewing the management agreement um, and they asked us for um, our comments. Um, I asked them sort of why they're reviewing it, what they hope to uh, obtain with it, what their goals were, and they've been very resistant to that. And I re, re asked that question recently and I got back the answer we're seeking to make the documents clearer. Um, this the, the initial agreement, they're, they're like ourselves and Alamo, they're all the short life properties, street properties that were in Islington and they were owned by LB Islington. And so the arrangement for allocations will be, is partially with them as well. So I think we've got a bit of a sort of backup via LBI, hopefully, were there to sort of go the way of, of Optiva. Um, Network, I don't know. They, they seem to have resisted um, um, any moves to, for sort of merging. They have sort of flirted with people, but they seem to sort of happy to stay where they are. They're not small. They're quite big. But, um, yeah, one doesn't entirely trust them, put it that way. Um, and, yeah, I await further developments, really. I'm pushing them on, on, on sort of what they want to do with, with regard to that. Um, the management agreement, as far I need to again look at sort of the details of sort of how they need to change it because I think they need to give us, I think, six months' notice, if memory serves, to terminate the agreement and then reform another one. Um, but yeah, I will, um, it requires further legal and/or me going through, trawling through the management agreement. Yes, it's all, it's all getting a bit whiffy. Is all I would say. And that's me for the moment. Yeah. Sweetheart. And sorry, then Martin. I'm sorry, I've just realised I've got a webinar to attend. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask Mark. Um, sorry, Martin. Kate was first. Sorry. Kate. I, I, I just wanted to say, from the point of view, as far as I understand it, from what I've seen from John you know, at Unit 11. It was strange because they asked for our comments on the management agreement, which is almost, but it seemed incredibly token because that that was, we were commenting on something that we already, we've had for years, but not, you know, it's like comment on what, because we don't know what they're even thinking about in terms of changing. It, see, it seemed very like a sort of, they'd been told they had to ask for our input, but, um, they weren't giving us anything to input on or something, which was a bit suspicious. Anyway. Martin? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Mark. Um, I thought um, 
the funding idea was a good argument. Um, if you can establish, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, do you know they were funded by Minihag in the first place? Um, which you, it must be some record of that. The second one is when Waltham Forest took our two of ours back, which we'd had for nearly 30 years, the first argument we had was to basically top up how much we'd spent on them over the years um, and basically add plus the original funding, which was actually GLC money, and then basically sort of present that as a bill. Uh, were those, are those properties you were managing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we started off as a short life cub. At one point, we had 52 properties on the M11 extension. Um, uh, DOT, Department of Transport's um, compulsory purchase. Uh, at one point, we spent nearly more than just under half a million, I think, in Minihag money of so, through Solon in East London on those properties. So, um, you know... That's where we, we started. And so, but we did have a couple from Waltham Forest, but yeah, I mean, at one point we did tot up how much we'd actually spent on maintaining them over the years, plus the original grant in an attempt to concentrate Waltham Forest mind on just dragging them back. Well, I, I think that the argument about um what they what where the money came from for them so in a sense why the association has them that the association has them because they there was a grant for the development of co-op co managed properties um is is a strong one in campaigning it was the one that i would expect a board to take uh, cognizance of uh, but um it, it does seem very difficult to uh, to get the, the the details of this. I haven't actually done the uh, freedom of information request, uh, but somebody else has done it quite carefully uh, for for their co-op. Um, somebody from Southbank um, and uh, didn't actually get any response or nothing useful. Apparently, I mean, I think the housing corporation lost a load of documents in a fire somewhere, right. some way back. Someone told me in two thousand. It's a flood, I think. They lost oh, flood. Their housing Association grant documents, including many grant documents, were destroyed. So they're yeah. being on the books of uh, registered providers. So if it's to be truthful about the actual amount of grant that they received over the years, it uh, might be worthwhile exploring that at some stage or other. Yeah. Because it could be useful for co-ops to know that the uh, grant... No Always keep your paperwork, that's what I found. Yeah, yeah, there's no record of them actually receiving grant. Interesting question to ask. Maybe we could explore that at some stage, Martin. Reckon, yeah, be fun, a little bit of fun. Um, John, on your issue, uh, in another role I'm doing, I'm looking into housing associations in Islington at the, uh, uh, this year. Be glad to get your input from this and the treatment of uh, network. Uh, of these uh, properties because they were granted to the council on provision that the uh, co-ops were kept going. And if you need support from the council, let me know and I will mobilize people to try and help you out. Thank you for that. Michael, yeah. Well, oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, there is a report on housing associations, uh, which was produced anonymously. I'm happy, I've been, got permission of the order to share it widely. So I'm happy to put that on the, uh, Facebook, the uh, Facebook page and uh, into the blog. I think, uh, Niall, you know who I'm talking about and the report I'm talking about. And it's a useful document and it's a useful resource to have if you have to battle housing associations, etc. cetera. Uh, with that said, does anybody have, uh, Glenn? Can I ask a question here? I was on the board of Watford Community Housing Trust for a few years. In that case, the, the properties were transferred from the Liberal Democrat controlled Watford Council to this trust, which allegedly was to give the, 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 the tenants a lot more say how much it's finally ended up is another question. But the point was that they had to get a ballot from the, the tenants to do it. Is it a reverse procedure where if you, if you have been transferred, you can have a ballot to go back or to go to, I mean, the, the, the right to manage is the tenants in other than council housing do not have the right to manage. But I mean, that's something we, uh, in, in other places we should campaign for, that tenants should have the right to manage. 
but can they go back once they've been transferred? Well, that's an interesting point. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I seem to remember that if you transfer it over, if you transfer over from a council property, uh, you brought your secure tenancy with you. That's right. Your yeah, that's very true, isn't it? With the exception, though, with, uh, some of these were licenses, so that, uh, that's different again. And they would have been, been converted into short hold of short tenancies from last month. So I think the thing is uh, more uh, complicated than it seems. Stephen, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Mick. I, I just wanted to say that um, there's a group of housing co-ops in South East London who are, who are managing agents for Hexagon Housing Association, which is not as big as many yes. of the others. Uh, we, I think we have, and, and Mark would know better than I, I think we've got about 10% of the total hexagon properties. But what's happened in the last couple of years, and it's now just come to the boil, but we wanted it to happen as well, is that hexagon have now um, drafted a revised management agreement that they're going to bring forward to us. And we've just had a copy of it. We've been waiting, as I say, for a long time for this because the, the other agreement is many years out of date, it was done many years ago. But I, in that context, I just wanted to identify with some of the remarks that Niall made. I think the way housing associations, and I include Hexagon in this, are generally behaving is that they are behaving in a, in a different kind of way because of pressures that the government's putting on them, but also that they've become much more commercially um, oriented really and I think we're worried that we're going to get foisted on us a management agreement that will not suit us but we're trying as a network of housing associations to deal with hexagon together although each housing association has got a unique history and some unique characteristics and hexagon will have an agreement with the individual housing co-op as a managing agent but we're trying initially to get some general principles established. And we're just at the beginning of that journey. We've just been sent the 70 page roughly document, which doesn't include all the appendices and schedules. So we're beginning to pour over that. And, and we're just for people's information, we're about to go into that kind of negotiating process in, in the coming year, I think. It'll take a good six months or so, I think, to. To, uh, to push it. But I think some of us are very worried at the kinds of things that, that, um, that uh, the details that Niall alluded to might be foisted on us, really. And I think the final point I want to make, which may just apply to Balfour Street, but one of the things when Hexagon have been a bit of a shower in the past and not served our interests, we've, we've tried to find the historic documents that show this was count these were council properties that they were, or council owned them, that they were going to demolish for a major redevelopment and, and a local group took them over under a short life arrangement and it's gone on from there. And they now happen to be in, Hex well, they've been in Hexagon's hands for a good 10 years now, I'd say, because they took over from Solon Southeast down here. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else want to come in on this? Wind up the debate? Greg? Well, it, this sounds like, I mean, we tried to set up a group just about housing association management co-ops a couple of years ago, but there wasn't anything to really bring it together. This does sound like one task that is very specific. If, if there are things that co-ops want to have in the agreement, it could be worth meeting to actually have a fairly generic agreement with key terms have been agreed after sort of wider discussion to actually put it forward together. I presume the housing association officers are actually talking to each other. So a united front rather than um, higgledy piggledy could, in, you know, avoid reinventing the wheel and allow possibly some pooling of resources for any legal advice over some recent legal changes to be absolutely clear but that obviously requires a few HAMC to actually want that to happen I'm happy to help facilitate that but uh, obviously not happy to run it 
Come on, are you listening to it or not? Yes, I was, thank okay. you. It's on. It certainly is, hello. <laughs> Martin, you wanted to come in? Uh, no, I was just, well, I just wanted Sorry. to agree with everything that Greg said. And um, I, I think we need this and being able to, I, I wouldn't be that confident that the housing associations are liaising with each other. If the co-ops can liaise with each other, then I think that's a source of strength because we can point to different agreements. So for instance, um, my co-op is also part of the Hexagon group and I, I should declare I'm also actually a Hexagon resident board member. So interest declared there. Um, uh, but uh, it's possible to compare what Optivo are doing to what Hexagon are doing where and try and get them both to do the best of what each other are doing. Yeah. Um, the, the pressures, I, th I think this, the size issue is, is important. You know, it, mm. we are very small in the world of say Optivo, rather bigger in the case of Hexagon. Um, and boards, are, there's a danger that you just become so much of a problem that they say, we can end this under the current agreement, let's just end it. That's the kind of nuclear option. Martin and then Emma, and then I want to end this uh, debate because uh, mm -hmm. it's flowing on. I mean, well, it's another major item to deal with. Well, just going, going back to Mark's point about you know institutional memory, I mean, it strikes me one of the iniquities of this is that most of these organisations, if not directly, but certainly indirectly, front their way back to the old secondary housing co-op movement, certainly true of Stadium Network, Solon's, mm. um, and they became Solon was their TP team originally, and Hexagon basically go back to the days of Axel and Chisel and South London Family mm -hmm. Housing. I mean, mm -hmm. all of these properties basically become mm -hmm. under housing association management via the old secondary housing co op network. I mean, one, mm -hmm. they need to be reminded of their past and future mm -hmm. responsibilities, mm -hmm. and secondly, mm -hmm. again, it goes back to there was a lot of money floating around when those properties. Mm -hmm got mm. developed and you know mm. they took their cut of that money and they also need to be cognizant of, of that history. Emma? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly, you know, with Optivo, it's definitely been an agenda item as there is with Hexagon. Um, I'm also part of Hecmath in, in Lewisham, but I think it's well worth speaking to, you know, kind of other co-ops that are under this arrangement because I think, you know, I think particularly just to focus on TiVo as well as our own because I think that will certainly set the tone you know, because I think you know certainly the HAs are talking to each other at that level with management agreement so it's definitely going to set the tone for others really so I just wondered if there's other representation you know is this is there other you know, kind of representation outside of London maybe you know um, maybe you know kind of in the you know in the UK or Wales or anywhere else really to be fair um, because I think with Optivo, I think yeah, it will just set the it will just set the tone for the rest of us. Really, I've got to worry about if we don't get that right, you know. Fine, Glenn. Yeah, I wanted to raise the issue of charitable housing associations uh, and the, the, their role in dealing. So, general, I'm not confirmed these cases have been brought to, to our attention today, and that there, I mean, it, it could be. That the tenants could appeal to the charity commissioners to investigate what these people are doing and as far as secondary housing association i was formerly on the board of cds which is no longer a co-op it's a charity and they have 40 co-ops in, in their stable 4,000 tenants for you know tenancies and it's very important that people should have their rights and just because you become a charity may you may escape from a, a sort of vat and things like that but if it also means that you don't have a responsibility to your, your tenants, that is an issue that we should be looking at. Especially I think this is going to go on and on, and uh, it's now it's getting near 12 o'clock. So I'd like to move on to the main. Uh, does anybody really have anything absolutely urgent to say about this? Because I believe this is going to, we are go this is going to be raised uh, again and again. And we will be coming back to this in future meetings, I suspect, as it's not going to go away, given the greed of housing associations. Catherine, I'll bring you in, but this is the last person I'm taking on this item. Thank you very much. I just have a simple question, and maybe I didn't get everything that has been said. Um, we are newcomers to, your, to you all. Uh, 
we were told that um, co-ops want to form a new sort of um, pressure group for local governments and, and, and just to come together as co-ops. Is this going to happen or are we going back to old networks? Uh, I wasn't quite clear of that. I think someone from St. Mark's talked to us and said um, people, co-ops want to um, form a new network of co-ops to see what they together can achieve in terms of putting pressure on politicians, local authorities, and also to interchange more information. Is this, uh, am I wrong here or are we going to do that? Greg? Um, I think they were talking to the Marks, they are a short life co-op and we're going to be talking about a network of things we're doing with short life co-ops. London Federation is a network of all different types of housing co-ops and this is the sort of way we meet and then we set up other groups that take on different tasks and challenges and so through London Fed, I'm a member of the London Housing Panel, which feeds into the Mayor's Housing Committee. So I think you've got a bit of a mixed message, but overall it's right in mm -hmm. that we are doing more about short life housing specifically now, but we're also doing, would like to do something about management co-ops with housing associations and other times we do think of TM. It's whatever's topical it will be where we put our energy. So I'm looking sideways because I've got two screens. Okay. okay. In that case, that's um, an ideal um, uh, opportunity to we lead on to the next item on the agenda. Greg, do you want to? Uh, Certainly, I shall. With short life. I've got a few things to pull up. So I'm hoping, oh, that's good. That's excellent. Uh, will it let me? Oh, is that good enough? Can people read that? Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, I'm not going to kill you by short um, uh, PowerPoints, but it's it tends to be a little bit easier if there's something to refer to as we go through, and then people ask if I can share it. And if people have questions, it's easier to go back to it. So this is a little bit a potted history of short life cults for those that don't know. Um, a bit about guardians and then really what we're trying to do at the moment to say that explain why we want to support short life housing again and why guardians are the spawn of satan and shouldn't be supported um, obviously historically there were a as our mark martin said earlier on a lot of you know dozens maybe scores of short life co-ops across london spotted a spelling mistake then I'll come back later I hate that ex-teacher in me um, the whole the way things were done were different they used to be like councils building big housing estates um, there were big projects like the M11 link and the M25 these involved big compulsory purchases and properties empty for a long time often um, we thought there was pressure on housing then but nothing like it was now and councils were even demolishing properties to stop people squatting in them or going in, smashing out roofs, floors, toilets. Obviously, that was something that was unsustainable and politically, it just couldn't be justified. So one of the ways around it was people, through a variety of methods, either squatters coming to an arrangement or existing groups approaching landlords, short life co-ops, agree to manage properties on a meantime basis and either taking over properties that the council couldn't do up and then doing them up with council grants or taking over properties until the major project took place. So the M11 link it was obviously several years between properties being bought to get the land and the motorway actually being built. And so I'm getting the messages coming up at the same time. Um, Housing Corporation grant sponsored this, so it became quite a big thing with large sums of money involved. Um, now, this 
people have the impression this stopped in the 1990s. It's not really the case. There have been short life co-ops that have carried on going. Um, so I was hoping there'd be people from Phoenix here today and from St. Mark's that are still doing it, uh, where it's most of their existing properties are short life. But over time, as council stopped building and housing projects moved at a different speed, together with obviously being for less grants, there were few properties to move on to. So short life co-ops either became static and managed to buy the properties, or they held them until the landlord finally said they wanted them back. Or just over time, they, they sort of lost the properties. And in, so we have this situation where only a few remain. But nevertheless, they haven't completely disappeared. In the meantime, though, um, what's become a lot more common is guardianship, which is a sort of non-cooperative alternative to short life housing. It began in quite a sort of funky, friendly way with people staying in people's homes while they went on holiday or travelled so that uh, burglars wouldn't break in. But over time, it became more about stopping squatters coming in or for um, warehouses or uh, business premises to stop them having to pay business rates. It became much more commercialised. And they, instead of being moving into people's furnished houses while they were away, where so you could play with their big TV and whatnot in swimming pools, it became um, just providing security staff for, you know, in exchange for no, uh, no, it wasn't no rent anymore, but it became low rent. And the company started to make money out of both the landlord and the tenants, and often quite large amounts of money. According to the GLA, the average rents across London are £475 a month, which is allegedly around about 50% of market rents. But that's 50% of the market rent for a good quality home with security of tenure. And whereas people were obviously quite flexible when it was a nice home for next to no rent, as people start to be getting charged a bit more rent, up to 80% of market rents in some cases, there started to be friction as people started to feel they were being treated quite badly. And as they ramped up the scale, instead of a, a small club of people, it became people being offered actual tenancies, you know, through online apps or advertised elsewhere, which turned out to be somewhat less than they were expecting. Now, as time's gone on, there've been a number of court cases if you look them up, going back to the early 2000s, um, picking up with the rapidity from 2010, 2012 onwards. My favourite website for this sort of advice is Nearly Legal. If you um, go on search for them and do a search for Camelot or Guardians or Guardianship, you'll find dozens of different court cases. But these are just one or two that I've picked out. Bristol Council. Um, they were housing people in next nurse accommodation and they went to court to say that they did actually have tenancies and Camelot was actually using an unlicensed HMO. That started to change the way that a lot of people thought about. Well, for a long time, housing professionals have been saying that the agreements that Guardian companies use were somewhat dodgy and that some of the points were put in were basically a sham. Camelot versus Coote was a um, first serious challenge legally to whether Camelot agreements are a sham. Um, but those have carried on since. Um, Oxley versus Living Guardians was another one about unlicensed HMOs where people started to get be given rent repayment orders. So when the Oxley left there, and sued for having been in an unlicensed HMO. They had about £4,000 um, actually um, repaid as damages. Culture to Council versus Camelot, they submit, agreed to 15 unlicensed HMOs. These are quite large amounts of money. The problem is, <laughs> once they lost those cases, Camelot and others have got a bit of a history of just dissolving one company and transferring the assets to others within their uh, network. 
And so Camelot dissolved and reformed with some of the same directors and expected to carry on with the same property agreements with councils as Watchtower. All of this is um, somewhat dodgy. When they were uh, dealing with small numbers of people that were by agreement going in to look up, trying to fudge a way of looking after people's homes, that's they sort of get away with that. This has sort of moved into mainstream housing. Um, the government says there's about a thousand properties managed by guardians in London. The GLA say that's nonsense. There's more than a thousand with the local authorities alone. And if you look at the numbers of lists and the number of properties actually claimed by guardians companies, it's probably closer to several thousand. So it's actually becoming quite a large unregulated section of the housing market, which is really not the GLA wants when it wants good quality housing for Londoners. So you could obviously spend some time looking at the advantages and the disadvantages of each model are. Um, I'm aware that it's 12 o'clock and I'm hoping people want to discuss this. So I'm not gonna go into too much into the detail of the specific advantages and disadvantages of each. Although in that online blog I did, I've set out a few of them, which we can obviously expand on later. For the time being, I think it's enough simply to say that we're bloody marvelous, funky and dead good, whereas guardianship companies are a bit dodgy. And we can, if anyone wants to know a bit more detail, obviously we can look at that in the questions. What we want to do as London Fed is to try and promote short life somewhat. Um, as the teacher and me. Um, through the London Housing Panel, we want to persuade the GLA and the Mayor that short life housing should be the preferred option wherever possible. Through social media and the housing press, we want to publish the advantages of short life co-ops. And from a comparison of the existing management agreements that exist, this is a bit odd. Unlike the um, Management Co-ops and Housing Association, a bit worried about looking at management agreements again, we want to actively do that from the short life point of view, to have a modern agreement that we can take to councils and say, this is bang up to date. This is approved by the GLA. This is approved maybe by the high housing regulator too, but this is best practice and you can trust it. So you're not taking a personal risk. And then also, obviously, any good short life project we can take videos on, get pictures of, accounts of. We want to celebrate those through the annual reports, blog posts, YouTube, and value the expertise that we have because we want to expand the short life movement. Those people that know about it need to be encouraged to share their expertise with new people coming into it. So that's what we're seeking to do. And we have made a start on it. Uh, we've begun meetings with between representative of guardians who want to become a co-op. Um, some of those are taking legal action. Um, I can answer questions on those, but obviously can't put that in writing. Existing short life co-ops and action on empty homes, a charity that tries to bring um, empty homes back into use. We've begun looking at different old and new agreements and modular management agreements as a precursor to working at what should be in our own. We're discussing what a PR approach should be. Although if a PR person yeah. asks me, what should we do for PR? Okay, well, I don't know, you're the PR professional, but we're, we're having that discussion. We've begun a blog to put as part of updating the website. Um, That's the one who's speaking. Can you see? And further meetings, yeah. well, not, further meetings, publications, it. YouTube videos, <laughs> and all that sort of thing are things that are going to come in the future. Is, but, uh, that's a script that he's so I can't mute everyone else because I'm speaking. But if I'm speaking, yeah, please good. hold off or just mute yourself. Yeah. Um, that's all I was going to say. I just wanted to prompt people to um, have a chance to actually talk about this. There's more of information I've got, but I thought this was enough to start the discussion. Okay. Thanks for that, Greg. Uh, I'm seeing your screen at the moment, your PowerPoint presentation. I wonder if you could put that into the chat. I'll do uh, that again now. Yeah, already have. Now you can see the full screen. So does anybody want to kick off there? Emma? 
Uh, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. I mean, I think it's um, quite a number of co-ops started off, you know, in this way. So I think things go in a very cyclical way. And I think it's really just about, you know, learning the, you know, kind of history and a lot of which experience that we have amongst us really to look at, you know, to look at, you know, look at that model and then how we've sustained ourselves as co-ops beyond that really, to be fair. Um, there is the, um, I'm just thinking as part of the GLA, which is, because I'm also a member of ASH, which is the Community Land Trust in Lewisham, Lundborough Lewisham. Um, and we're also looking at various um, models in terms of, you know, in terms of sites and also looking at empty properties to take on, um, you know, like, you know, kind of a short long lease, you know, to kind of begin with. So lots of other groups out there, but yeah, no, I think it's a great idea actually. Martin, after uh, Catherine. Catherine. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Greg. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I think this was really good. We'd love to talk to you some more. Um, so, would you say it's like uh, Camelot and Guardians? They're like the Uber in the taxi trade kind of thing. Yeah. It's all a bit dodgy, and they're having all these, you know, and they're actually taking money from both sides, and they're basically only commercially driven. Uh, so yeah, we get that, and we're absolutely on your side, and we'd love to um, have your information and, and get in touch with you, really. No, that's fine. Yeah. I think you've got my email address. Um, Martin? And not then... yet? No. Yeah. Um, I, I, at the risk of alienating everybody here, um, I think you'll be really careful. I mean, Emma was talking about historically. I mean, historically, I'm, I've just put up in the chat, I always saw Short Life as a way for co-ops to cut their teeth before moving on to something permanent. It's like being on training wheels, uh, get what you have in management and stuff in place. But I have to say in my co-ops experience, I never saw short, to, uh, short life as a, a long-term option. I always said that it was worth putting your time and money and experience and your voluntary time into being permanent. And I think in some ways, I mean, not to say it doesn't have a role to play and we certainly got 10 years or more of life out of properties, which, which I say gave us a chance to get grounded. But I mean, looking at that documentary it was on the other day about uh, shared ownership. I mean, fundamentally, English land law fundamentally comes down to ownership. If you don't own, you're screwed at some point. That's that's actually the truth. And you know, leasehold, all that sort of stuff. It's just it's just different versions of the same stuff. That fundamentally, you're not your own boss. So, I mean, I think we have to be clear about what role short life can play in relation to it being a short term fix or you know a medium term option, but. The idea that somehow it's got some sort of long-term future, you know, in providing long-term homes for people, I think, you know, we have to be very careful about because that's where people have got themselves trapped. Alexandros? I have a very quick question about uh, the, the different types of co-ops. What's the short life and what's the permanent one? For example, in our co-op, you could be in accommodation and you could be there for a long time uh, until you know the council or the management company wants it back and everything. So uh, what exactly is the short life uh, co-op? If you can explain to me quickly, otherwise I can look it up, you know, no problem. Well, it's just explained it. Right. Yeah. Short <laughs> life means that essentially it is temporary and the landlord can just ask for it back. All right, so we um, are... On uh, it might, sometimes that's a long time. Sometimes yeah, it's yeah. a year. I get it. I get it. If you own it, you own it. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Ownership is the key. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eight years in a short in a short life house that had been going for, but eventually it went for about forty years before the council took it back. Same here. Yeah. Don't press anything. If I don't want to press anything, I just leave it. You don't do anything. You just look. You just watch and listen. Does anybody else want to come in here to speak? John? John, John Elgy? Yes, I, I kind of agree with Martin as well. We did cut our teeth in short life. Um, although the development that Unit 11 eventually sort of got together, some of the houses we had had been short life management for 20 to 25 years. But that is not the that's not how the modern housing world works. So I don't think yes, we can revisit sort of some of our old expertise. But I do think it's a it's a different world we inhabit now. And I agree with Martin in, in as much as that yes, we want permanence. We don't want short life. 
but I'm happy to sort of um, sort of uh, give my sort of fuzzy memory a sort of a, a, a brush up and sort of help whomever. Yeah. Kate? Just really quickly, we, we're, um, I mean, we're now permanent, but we're not owners. We're rent. We're still renting, but it, but it makes an awful lot of difference being permanent in all the quality of housing. Most you know, most most definitely. Can you explain that? Sorry. You rent, can you? I mean, who's the freeholder? The our landlord and network housing association, and we're the managing agent, but we're renting, not owner occupying. So we didn't, we never bought, the, the properties were bought from the council, but not, you know, it was, anyway, it's a, it was a huge long scheme. It was through Solon at the time. But this is my point. It's, this goes back to the previous discussion that the Housing Association, I mean, it's the same with Coin Street. I mean, a lot of cults of our generation or the generation that came out in the sort of mid seventies through to the mid eighties. Um, I mean, even in deals like Coin Street, you know, um, if you're not the freeholder, you're still at somebody's beck and call. That's the bottom line in relation to your um, situation, in relation to your agreements that you may or may not have. Coin Street co-ops have been having problems, isn't it? Um, and it's the same with St. Mark's. I mean, at some point, I think I've, you've got to investigate the possibility of trying to re have some sort of co-op ability to stop transfer. That basically putting all this time and sweat equity in should count for something and you should have the ability to own a freehold. That's where I think we should go. So I bring in Mark first, Mark, and then Kate. Yeah, I just, um, I, I don't disagree with Martin, but Thank the possibilities Greg. for that are, uh, are limited. Meanwhile, there's a lot of people living in guardianship schemes who are being treated very badly. And, um, and there's a whole generation of young people there um, in my day job at Chisel, we've housed some of those people into shared houses and um, there's energy there. You know, back in the 80s, that was me. Um, and we went into short life and we, you know, short life for our needs at that time was great. Um, and, and then it became permanent because, you know, the, the wind was behind us for a while in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I, I think that the initiative that Greg's talking about could bring in a bunch of uh, people, younger people, 20s, early 30s, who would become cooperators of the, well, of, of the future. And it could be a reinvigoration of the, of the co-op movement. You know, it's something we've talked about in some of these meetings that there's a generation who are now in our 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, what happens in the, in the future? You know, it's one of the, those big things that we talk about. Um, this is one route, I think, to getting people on the training wheels and getting them better housed with more control of their housing. Kate? I just, um, I personally, I've no interest in owning property and I think this country is a bit obsessed with ownership, but I do, under, I, do I totally get it that, that everything's going in that direction. So it's not, it doesn't surprise me that our management agreement is under threat, for example. So, I, and I, 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 I I totally appreciate that the level of insecurity, but I don't. I, I I'm resistant to thinking that the only way to the only road to success is through ownership. Personally, collective collective ownership. The organisation yeah. owns it, not you. Yeah, I understand, but still, yeah, yeah. Greg, and then Noel. I think Mark said what I, a lot of what I was going to say, which is sort of bringing it back on topic. Yes, I would prefer to be owning the place with a freehold. If we can't have a freehold, a long lease, we can't have a long lease, a strong, secure management agreement. But I'd still rather be in a short life co op than living as a guardian company. And that, that, that's the point. It's about giving people control. And politically, we either keep making the cooperative option available and allowing people to take control of their own lives or we allow it to be taken away. And this is just one of those ways of doing it because at the moment, for the reasons I mentioned, guardianship companies are being shown not to be the safe pair of hands that people thought they were. They're being shown as being questionable landlords and they're creating risks. As um, I didn't go into it earlier, but there's some of the risks to the landlord can be transferred to what they call the superior landlord. So it's not just a reputational risk, 
that a council could find is a rent repayment order for the rent the Guardian paid to the guardianship company. And these are things that un, we can sort out. That we're doing things on a not-for-profit basis, so those rents aren't going out to a private individual in Holland. This is about mutual respect and control, and we should be able to sell that to people. And this is about doing it together, so each group trying to do it isn't reinventing the world because we're stronger together. No. Yeah, uh, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think, you know, really good points made here. And um, it's a bit of a needs must at the moment, isn't it? Uh, you know, if the guardianship initiative, whatever you want to call it, is obviously not working out. I mean, you sort of know the interest behind it and it wasn't going to be, you know, housing people the way we'd like. Then I think we should step into the gap as much as possible. And uh, along the lines that Greg's saying, and maybe Greg, I don't know, I, d I didn't follow everything. It's a bit quick. Some of this slide. I don't know if you've got a, a, a any sort of links or ideas of the number of guardianship places or identified areas, or is, there, is one of these sort of map, you know, interactive maps? Can we find out locally? Uh, you know, potential properties and so on, just to make things a bit more concrete. Uh, you know, or have you any idea of the numbers of people involved in the guardianships at the moment? But I think it's right. We should um, we should try we should look at it and. Um, I mean, things have changed, obviously, but I think our overarching sort of campaign, if you like, or sort of overarching goal is that, uh, you know, uh, it should be long term secure housing that we want to give people. Just as it was in the past, and of course, things have changed because in the past you had the housing, housing authority grant and other ways of turning short life into long life. And even if the guardianships, if, if we were able to intervene there as co-ops, um, you know, we, you know, I think it's right what Martin and others say. We, we, you know, that that's a starting point, and that's good. It's particularly good for young people, but we still have to push for longer term, uh, you know, secure, uh, you know, ownership. And I agree. I mean, I, I know what Kate's saying. Uh, you know, it's not a question of, um, you know, home ownership as, as such as we're talking about collective. And uh, you know, and interesting. I've just been reading now uh, Frederick Engels. Problems of the housing question is 200 years since he died, or is born, sorry. I was just re reading that pamphlet again from many years before, and all those debates come up then in the 1870s uh, about, you know, uh, was it was it an, a question of every worker getting a home, or should it be a collective approach? We had the worker getting every home, didn't we, with the council sell-off in the 70s, late 70s and 80s, and we saw where that led. So we do need general ownership. We need council mass house building. We all know that. That, that's the underpinning uh, solution, but I think it's right. We should step in where we can, and uh, but not lose sight overall. Because we, you know, I know young people would love to get into something like this, even if it's just for three, four, five years, given how precarious housing is at the moment. Uh, but then, you know, it has to be longer term if we want to settle communities in, in these areas. So, so I think you know, I agree. It's a good initiative, good ideas. Greg's putting out there. Um, if we can try and get more detail on it and work on it a bit and then in each authority look and see where what properties might be potential that we can um, we can push this issue on. Excellent idea. Um, one idea, you know, uh, one thing we should emphasize is that housing co-ops, we can use the uh, surpluses instead of them going over to Holland, they can be used to provide permanent housing for people <laughs> over the long term. Uh, and I think uh, local authorities might be amenable to that if the argument can be framed in a certain manner. No, I know that can't. Yeah. Uh, Ron? No, right. Yeah, I'm currently working with Plum Tree Housing Co-op, which is uh, newly set up in Croydon from a group of guardians in a property there. And the property belongs to Croydon Council, but was leased to Camelot. And then Camelot went out of existence and passed it on to Watchtower. Uh, the residents uh, then refused to pay anymore and they've currently got a rent repayment order claim which will be heard in February. The problem is this is coincided with Croydon as a council virtually collapsing and we're just not getting any communication out of them. I, I am now suggesting that we might have to look at being able to acquire the property uh, as the only way forward, because Croydon have announced they're going to be selling off lots of properties, and this might be one of their their prime candidates. So, you know, that's a discussion that's not yet finalised in terms of Plumtree's attitude, 
So I've got to hear back from them. But um, I do think that the reality is that there has to be some option where councils um, own the property, where there could be funding put in place to acquire them. <coughs> it's about acquiring them by way of a mortgage with the council. So <coughs> further to go in this, but I'd be very keen to talk to other people who are working with other groups of guardians uh, to see if we can share any knowledge and uh, any successes. Thanks. Emma, do you still want to say a bit? <coughs> are you happy? Uh, no, I was just I was just going to mention plum tree as an example, but that's already been done. So that's yeah, that's fine. Fair enough, Martin. Well, just listen to what Ron said. I mean, and take it with Greg. I mean, perhaps there's some way of stitching it together. I mean, mini hank was an incredibly good idea, wasn't it? I mean, it was a real value for money. Um, you know, as part of some sort of strategic idea of keeping properties in you know good, reasonable working order, etc., until they were going to be used. I mean, this idea of switching over from guardians to short life co-ops. I mean, if I mean, depending, I suppose, on who owns the property in the first place. But certainly, when you've got councils or you know the mayors doing schemes or these schemes they're looking at in relation to um, London transport, etc. I mean, could he be persuaded to perhaps come and think of a, a sort of a new version of mini hag to basically get around these guardian properties and you know perhaps see a whole raft of short life co-ops coming in to fill that gap and putting some money to basically do that and then ticking Ron's thing is find some way of acquiring these properties via some sort of um, stock transfer agreement or you know some sort of mortgage deal I mean that would be a great system if you could bolt it all together. Excellent idea Martin uh, it might be worthwhile having a conversation with Tom Copley the mayor's uh, or deputy mayor for housing there is the Community Housing Fund, which uh, I think is undersubscribed. And uh, this could be an opportunity to use that to actually buy the properties uh, with a little bit of grant and a loan, short life them for a few years till there were sufficient surpluses available to convert them into permanent properties. It might be worthwhile exploring that model. Greg, you're in the London Housing Panel. Do you uh... sort it, Greg? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, th this is well. I say we're trying to. Look, Tom Copley comes to some of our meetings. I'm going yeah. to be meeting with him next week. These are the sorts of things that I'm trying to put forward. Um, we've recently done a um, a publication sharing all of the different successes of the different groups within London Housing Panel. Um, they didn't allow me to include um, Bunker within that because they're outside the area. But groups like Quaggy um, and Leather Market, we've put in the, the developments that they've done. And this is the sort of thing that we can be putting in and sharing and celebrating and pushing forward as examples of where we can actually achieve something. It's also useful to be able to put some pressure on the community-led housing hub to say this is a project that will actually lead to some community-led housing rather than people talking about it. It's just obviously keeping everyone working together on the same topics without me getting worn out and falling into a heap on the floor. Fair enough. Ron? Um, yeah, just coming back on that, Plumtree are in touch with the community-led London housing hub. Um, so they were having a discussion with Lev on Friday, I believe. I haven't heard the outcome of that yet. But certainly they are being given some grant towards training and um, towards legal costs of negotiating uh, an agreement with the council. So you know, that, that's actually happening in terms of Plumtree. Um, so, you know, we're, there's a bit of an open door. Um, and I do think there's going to be very few examples of new co-ops coming about unless people can at least have somewhere temporary to live whilst they yeah. go through the very long-winded process of getting set up as a permanent scheme. Yeah. You, you could see that working quite well because Bunker's quite a good example, isn't it? I mean, the leading time well, there was shorter because it's easier to acquire. They had Brighton Council place and it costs less. Whereas London, the biggest problem was always the leading time, mainly because of the value of the, the land or the property, isn't it? I mean... The idea of short life building through and mix idea about you know because you could generate 
quite healthy surfaces on short life we used to. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody else want to contribute to this debate? Uh, in which case, then we finish this. Is there any other item on the agenda, Greg? The only other thing we said was that we're going to have another forum in February. Yeah. Um, we've got some issues that we know will be current then, obviously updates on what we're doing. But we're yeah. going to be doing some sort of survey to get feedback over the next few weeks about other activities maybe we ought to be doing and how COVID is affecting people, basically trying to scoop up from the wider membership that aren't taking part what's important to them. If anyone has anything that they would like considered for future agendas or just want to make a flag up now, we can't discuss them now, but if you mention them, we can make a note. I think we should keep the... Um Housing Association Management Co-ops on the agenda because I think that's fairly important. Sorry, Ron, you want to? Yeah, what, what date are you thinking of for that forum? The, the 12th of February is the date of the hearing for the rent repayment order for Plumtree. So it'd be Ooh. quite useful if it was after yeah. that date because then there might be an example of how people have fought back against Guardian companies. Yeah, we could certainly have it after that, I think. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> if we head towards, if it's the 12th, we head towards the 19th. Mark? Uh, in terms of agenda, I think the Together with Tenants and uh, white paper stuff, consequences for, uh, for co-ops, whether ownership or management, um, would be a good thing. That, that's something that we need to bear in mind in terms of the, um, the, the hammock you know, the Housing Association Management Co-ops discussion as well, because there are new duties on associations there that I think are to the advantage of managing co-ops. I understand the Housing Association movement has published a paper on uh, the um, Code of Governance relating to tenants and how they handle tenants. There's a new code of governance, uh, which yeah. Uh, yeah, which relates to the NHFs uh, together with tenants and yeah. what was in the green paper, some of which is now in the white paper. Yeah. So there's three three things that have all happened in you know within a month or so of each other there. And there'll be new duties on housing co-ops, which housing co-ops should be able to meet very easily in terms of yeah. the white paper. Yeah. Good to explore that, I think, at some future meeting. Uh, in which case, um, see, nobody else wants to uh, contribute to the debate. No, I only to say that I put it in the chat. If anyone wants to be part of that HAMC hammock group, uh, looking at management agreements and such like, email me and I'll put a list together or set up a meeting and whatever people want. Um, stay in touch. If you're not a member of the London Fed, obviously you can still take part in everything we do, but uh, we do need some subscriptions to function. So consider joining at least. Should that uh, email be to your, uh, your own address or to an LFHC address, Greg? Uh, if you it can be to either if you lose one, but send it to me because if it's me dealing with it. Okay, that's a we support housing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Well, Niall, well, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just, just briefly. Um, I mean, yeah, I think we should have the discussion on the white paper and the housing association's attitudes towards, I mean, because it'll be interesting discussion because there a lot of housing associations are hostile to tenants organizing themselves. And they yeah. tend to have in inverted commas, like yellow union, yellow tennis associations that they do exist. So I think that is a worthwhile discussion because we're not, our housing co-ops inside housing associations are not just in a vacuum, you know, they're uh, part of this process. And uh, just maybe, uh, I think maybe Greg, I just want to come in just highlighting the re revamping of the website and so on that's going on and just direct people's attention to it. Would be a good idea, Greg? Greg, what, do you want, you want me to, by then, we'll have more, there'll be more changes to the website. So, yeah, I can point, I can tell you how wonderful we are. So we sell might. it, Greg. Come on, sell it. 
<laughs> well, I mean, we're talking about having some things put in to talk, celebrate more about the cult movement, but have some more regular blog spots that can be shared on social media more easily. And we set up a YouTube channel for London Fed stuff. We need to start populating it and then we can share it and ensure it's of a good quality. Um, Excellent. It just obviously can't, obviously can't go out and do much videoing while we're in lockdown. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Greg, that group that you mentioned just earlier, uh, what's that group again called? We've got two things. If you want to be in, if you have a housing association management co-op, I said contact me. If you want to be involved with a short life bit, still contact me. Everything contact Greg. I can't Greg. read your email. Sorry, can you type it in for us? It doesn't... You keep sending me a file, which I can't access. I've typed in the email in the chat. Let me. Greg Robbins at wesupporthousing.co.uk. Yeah, that's gone to me privately, Greg. I think you need to share that. Uh... Yeah, it's not coming up, though. Sorry. Um... Oh, I've got it. Ah, okay. Is you send it, I can pick up things from the London Fed or Hillary can yeah. forward them to me anyway, so. In that case, uh, I think we can end the meeting if everybody's uh, agreeable and uh, get on with the rest of Saturday. So, <laughs> bye everybody and thanks for coming and bye hope bye. we end in a few months time when we have our next forum. Take care. Bye. 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 I might have some vision by then. So right. <laughs> Bye. 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 Yeah. Okay.